doing all right so my name is Derek and this is my dude his name is Judah can you guys say hi to Judah hi. all right Judah can you say hi back hi is his microphone on say it again hi it's not working you can hear him okay oh there we go it's on now hi there we go all right, hey, 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 no, 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 we're not, we're not going to be shy now, okay, here we go. Hey, what, uh, we, we have a Bible verse to say, don't we? Are you ready? All right, let's see it, let's do it. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, that I plan for good. So good, so good. All right, good job, buddy. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can leave now. You got the easy job. All right. Well, um, thank you, buddy. Um, well, as you might be able to tell where we're headed, we're going to be in Jeremiah 29. So if you have a Bible, let's open up Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, there should be a uh, Bible somewhere close by uh, on a seat if, uh, if you don't have one. But that's going to be where we camp out today. And as you kind of turn over there, I just want to tell you a story. Um, that uh, that I think will help us kind of get into Jeremiah chapter 29. So um, in the 1950s, there were five missionaries who made their way into Ecuador to share the gospel with a number of natives uh, there and, and, and help them um, come to know the love of Christ and, and those kinds of things. And they, they identified shortly after getting there this unreached people group um, called, I think I'm saying this correctly, and if I'm not, I, please forgive me, but I think I'm saying this right, which is the uh, Huarani uh, people. And the Huarani people were these, like, really, like, um, they, were, they were just really, like, violent. Uh, and, and their tribe was very, very small because they had so much violence within their own tribe of where they would murder one another and kill one another when things weren't going well, uh, that this, it never really got off the ground. It's never really, like, a, um, a, a very well-established tribe, because uh, anytime someone would rise up to try and do something to make it better, there would be these people who would come in, and they would, they would just, they would kill them to make sure that they couldn't do that or didn't do that, and, and there was no shift in power. Uh, but, but these missionaries had a heart to try and reach these people, so they, they decided that they were going to try and go slowly, and so they started by flying a plane over the jungle, um, over these, like, over this area, and they started using, like, a megaphone to communicate back and forth. They learned their language. They started communicating with these people, and then they started dropping gifts from the plane, which were well-received and well-accepted, and they were like, man, we're gaining some traction. So then they got on the ground, and they, they made camp next to this river that was nearby uh, the village in which the, these people uh, spent most of their time. They started having a few good interactions here and there, but the way that these, like, these people groups worked was they were, they were dominated by these, these basically ten leaders, or these ten warriors. And these ten warriors would go out and they would find food for the village or they would find uh, and they do all the hunting and then they bring it back and then they would support the village that way. And, and they landed near the river. These missionaries landed near the river at a time when these ten warriors were gone. They were outside of the, the camp. They were outside of the village. And when they came back and they saw these, these American missionaries infiltrating and, and having interaction with their people, they didn't take kindly to that and they went to the river, and they went to the banks of the river, and they killed those five men who were there to, to share the gospel and to proclaim the good news and who were kind and compassionate. And these men were armed, and they had weapons, and yet they chose not to use them. They chose to die for their faith, and they became martyrs. And I think a lot of times when we hear stories like that, we think, man, that's not fair. 
And we think the things like that shouldn't happen and things like that shouldn't take place. But I think one of the failures that we have um, made as a church is we often don't communicate very well the truth about following Jesus. We often don't communicate what is really entailed in following Jesus. And we make it seem like it's something that can just easily be added to the rest of our life. And nothing in the rest of our life has to change. We just now add Jesus to it. And it just makes our life that much better. And although I wouldn't say that that's necessarily all uh, false, I would also say that there is a there's a part of following Jesus called sanctification that's like the hardest thing you've ever tried to do. If you've ever tried to do anything, it's like the hardest thing you've ever tried to do. To become more like Christ. To rid yourself of just your 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 um, thought process and renew your mind. All of these things that begin to take place as you begin to be sanctified by God and by the Spirit. It's a very, very difficult process, but it is not a burden. And I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Because I think what we try and do is we try and sell people something so that it doesn't sound like a burden. The reality is, is that following Jesus, the best thing I can think of it is like it's like having kids. Like, you love these kids. These kids are beautiful kids. We love them so much, and they mean so much to us. And But they're and they're frustrating, as I'll be. <laughs> like, you can get out, right? Like they, they they drive you crazy sometimes. But but it doesn't change the fact that you love them and that you have all this joy stored in your heart for these children. Um, they're not a burden. You get what I'm saying? And I think sometimes it's like we try to make people, make sound, like following Jesus sound so good so that it doesn't sound like a burden. But we oftentimes make it and it lands too soft and it sounds and it, it, it just isn't really what following Jesus is like. Following Jesus is, is hard a lot of the time. It's difficult a lot of the time. And if we are being taught um, things like, you know, my son who just got up here and recited Jeremiah 29, 11, and that, that God knows the plans I have for you and the plans for good, still good, still good. We can do some real damage. To what it actually looks like to follow Jesus. And so I just want to make sure that we don't do that damage. So we're going to, over the next several weeks, we're starting this new series today called The Bible Doesn't Say That. And today we're going to look at Jeremiah 29 11 because it, it's not as you know black and white as we try and make it seem um, when we hang home decor in our house. And tattoo it on our bodies, right? Like it's just, it's not that, right? And next week we're going to talk about Philippians 4.13, another verse that we oftentimes will use out of context and out of its intended purpose. And uh, and I promise you, if you re- like, if you were to just say that verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. No, you cannot, okay? Uh, like we could just agree on that right now, we'd be a lot better off. But like you cannot. Um, and so um, th- there are there are things that that you will not be able to do. And and so the Bible just doesn't say that, right? Like we take these verses and we think this is what the Bible's saying, and the Bible just doesn't say that. So we wanted to talk about that over the next several weeks. So to kind of dive into Jeremiah 29 today, I've got to help you understand where we're coming from as we lead into Jeremiah 29. Because Jeremiah 29 comes at a really important part in Israel's history. It's a part where Israel's independence is ending. Their independence is ending. They're free people, and, it's, and, and that, is, that is ending. There, there, is, uh, there are these uh, people called the Babylonian. The Babylonian Empire is coming to take them captive and lead them back into Babylon. Now, Jeremiah is a prophet of God, and he begins to proclaim this to the people of Israel that, hey, there is an army from the north, and they're going to come, and they're going to invade, and they're going to take us back to Babylon, and everybody hates hearing that, and so they throw Jeremiah into a muddy pit, and and they beat him uh, within an inch of his life, and the whole time they're beating him, and the whole time they throw him in the pit, he just keeps saying, they're still coming, like, no matter how much you hit me, and no matter how bad you make it for me, they're still coming, right? Like, that's not changing the fact that they're still coming. And so uh, when we pick up in Jeremiah 29, what we're picking up is we're picking up in the midst of where Babylon has come and taken some people back already. All right, there, there, there's been a wave of people taken from Jerusalem to Babylon at this point. And, and so the, what the, the Babylonian strategy for how to make sure that, one, they stayed a really dominant empire for a really long time, and two, to make sure that other um, to make sure that other nations were were um, lesser than them was whenever they would go in and conquer a place, they would take the best of the best out of that place and take them back to Babylon. 
Now, they did this for a couple different reasons. One, again, was because, like, let's just be honest. Like, if we took the best of the best and you put them into a different culture, if they begin to adopt that culture, that just makes that culture that much better, right? Like, you have the best thinkers, you have the best leaders, you have the best uh, doctors, engineers, lawyers, or whatever. We could all say that that's a methodology for building a pretty good group of people. If we just went and got the best of the best and put them in a group, and then they adopted and were like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this Babylon thing, it's going to make Babylon that much better and that much stronger. The other thing it does is it weakens the other communities. When you take all the best of the best out of those communities, what it does is it leaves what's left of those nations, what's left of those people, so defenseless and so um, lowly that they couldn't possibly think to go against Babylon and win. Like it would be it would be completely impossible for them to do that. And so this is where the Israelites are. Some people have been taken, the best of the best have been taken out of Jerusalem and taken to Babylon. And there is this prophet, he's a false prophet, his name is um, Shemaiah, and he begins declaring that, hey, guys, don't worry, we're only going to be in Babylon for 24 months. Like, God's given me a message, and we're only going to be here for a couple of years. And what it does is it starts to spark this hope and this optimism amongst the people who are in Babylon. But then Jeremiah gets word of this message that Shemaiah has shared with the people uh, that are in Babylon, and he then has to write a letter um, because he, 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 has to, he has to set the record straight. He has to go, well, no, 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 actually, this is what God has said. And this is the glimpse, and this is the context of which Jeremiah 29, 11 comes out of. So you have all of that to get to understand, like, what is Jeremiah 29, 11 really saying? And this is the letter that Jeremiah wrote to those in exile. Starts in verse 4. All right? So let's read verse 4. It says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those who are carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase the number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place for i know the plans that i have for you declares the lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future then you will call on me and come and pray to me and i will listen to you you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart i will be found by you declares the lord and will bring back the, you from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, one of the most very interesting things that I think is about this passage is that oftentimes when we pull this, like when we go to grab verse 11 and we begin to put, try and put it in, apply it to our life, we miss a big point of context that Jeremiah starts with in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Where he uses a very key word, the word all. He says this. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Many times we make these verses about individuals. We make them about a person. And these verses are about a people. This is not a promise to an individual. This is a promise to a people. You get what I'm saying? And so what happens oftentimes in our 21st century American understanding of the Bible is we oftentimes we pick up this book and we begin to read it and we begin to put ourselves in the story and we begin to make ourselves the subject 
of the story. And this book is not about you, and it is not about me. This book is about God. And he is the subject of the story. He is the author of the story. He is the one writing the story. He's the one proclaiming the story. He's the one making the story. He's the one that knows how the story started and how the story ends. And when we pick up the book and we begin to make it about us or we begin to make it about an individual, even when we read a story about individuals in the Bible, the story is not about the individual. The story is still about God. Take Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses. The story is not about those people. The story is about God. The story is about Jesus. And if you look close enough, you'll see that story on every page of this book. You'll see Jesus on every page of this book. And as you begin to read, if you don't take off our like if we don't take off our glasses where we make the story about us, we misread and misuse the word of God. Far too often. And so what what really stands out to me in this is that like he's he's writing the story. It says that he's the one that brought them, took them out of the land and put them in captivity. He did it. They didn't do it themselves. Babylon didn't do it. He did it. <laughs> like, and so so you begin to kind of read and you begin to see, OK, he is talking to a people, but he gives instructions to these people. And what does he say? Do he says, settle down and get comfortable because you're not going anywhere for a while. And I know that that's not going to make you happy. But settle down and get comfortable. Because you're not going anywhere for a while. Now what if God wanted to say that to you today? About whatever plan or whatever dream or whatever vision or whatever idea that you have stirred up in your heart. About what the next few months are going to look like. About what the next few years are going to look like. Or about the next decade is going to look like for you. Could you accept that message from God if he said, you know what, get comfortable, settle down, you're going to be here a while. Like if, if God came to me, I'll just be honest with you, if God came to me today and said, Derek, your church is 200 people, you're going to be 200 people in five years, get comfortable, you're going to be here for a while. I'd be like, no, <laughs> nope, not okay with that, right? Like I would be, I would be very frustrated with that message if that was me. What about you? If God gave you that message, would you would you be frustrated with that message? We have to begin to ask ourselves, do are we are we even willing to listen to what God has for us? Are we willing to like just accept that what his plan is instead of ours? The reality is is that you may not like your job right now, and what he says is pray for it. You may not like the political system that's at war within America right now, that every time an election comes up, we just can't stop bickering each other on social media. He said, pray for it. He says, you might see, like, you might see all this angst and you might see all these things happening in our culture and our society that do not look anything like Christ. He's saying, pray for it. Because you're going to be there a while. He's, he, he, he's saying to you, like, you may, you may be trying to put off having children or something else that you really have on your heart until you're in a better situation, until your circumstance gets better. And he's saying, just do it now because you're going to be here for a while. There, there, are, there are things that we have in our heads and in our hearts and our plans that we have made. And he's saying, look, I don't know. Uh, that you're going to be real happy when you realize that your plan is not my plan. So you better settle down and get comfortable because my plan doesn't look like what you think it does. Can we hear that message? And my guess is, if we're not careful, we won't hear it because we'll be doing what, the, what, what these people were doing. Uh, that, that Jeremiah talks about these people doing in verse 8 and 9. Uh, this is, these are probably two of my favorite verses in this whole story. Um, but in verse 8 and 9, I, I love how Jeremiah writes this. He says, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets or diviners among you deceive you. 
Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. I love this because he puts it back on them. He's like, guys, you're asking for them to tell you good news. Like, you're going to them, and all you want answers. It's going to make your life better. They can give that to you. It doesn't mean it's a word from God. Like, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tell you what makes you happy. Stop going to them and asking them to give you a dream that's going to make you feel better. But we all kind of want answers, right? Like when you're in a place where you're like, I don't know how I got here and I don't know how I'm going to get out, you kind of want answers. And so you start going searching for answers. And the hard part is, if we're not careful, we'll go searching for answers and we'll get answers that sound good but aren't actually from God. But they make us happy, so we stop searching for answers at that point, because we're good. Here's the other thing, is that, and can I, let me, can I, can I share something that I think we should ask ourselves? Thank you for giving me permission. Okay. Um, All right. I think we should be asking ourselves, do we come to church to To hear something that makes us feel better? Do you guys come to church to hear things that make you feel better? I don't, I don't know. Um, But based off of this passage, I would say we should not do that. We should not come to church saying, man... I'm going to church today because it's going to make me feel better. I I believe that's possible. I believe being with the saints, hearing the word of God, feeling the spirit move, I believe all of that's possible. But if you think that God is just going to tell you exactly what you want to hear to make you feel better, you're in the wrong place. And if you go to a church and the reason why you go there is because it just makes you feel better every week. You have to really ask yourself, is that really the word of God? Because the word of God is something that if we actually hear the word of God, it should cause us to go home and start to wrestle. It should cause us to go home and start to wonder like, man, like, what do I got to do to like live that way? And so I think, I think in reality, we have to begin to ask ourselves, are we doing this? Are we coming to places like this and hoping and asking people like me to say something that will just make us feel better? I hope not. But maybe, maybe we are. And if that's us, that's okay. You're in a safe place. But let's, let's start actually looking and, and listening for what God is really saying. And what God really wants to communicate instead of just listening for or listening to people that make us feel better. Because I could say a lot of things from stage today that would make you feel better. And I could probably find a verse or two and pull it out of context and make you feel better. That that's what the Bible actually says. But the Bible does not say that. So you have to be careful on what we are really searching for when we come to church searching for answers because jeremiah then gives them some really bad news verse 10 verse 10 he says this he says this is what the lord says when 70 years are completed for babylon i will come and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place can you imagine being 25 years old and hearing that Can you imagine being 50 years old and hearing that? In 70 years? Now, in order to understand the weight of why this would have meant so much to the Israelites, you have to kind of understand Israel's history. And so I want to just take us to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for just a second because um, this is a part of Israel's history. Deuteronomy is a book that's written right as uh, the Israelites are about to take um, hold of the promised land. And so... 
They've gone through the 40 years in the wilderness. They're getting ready to walk into the promised land. And God wants to create this people. He wants to renew a covenant with them before headed into the promised land. And so he begins to do that. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, here is here is the theology that's in the heart of the Israelites. God has worked so hard to free them, lead them through the wilderness for 40 years, build them into a people to lead them into a promised land that they aren't capable of taking without him. Like without God, none of this would happen. But every time they go up against an army during this time, they win. Doesn't matter how much stronger that army is than them. Every time that they go into a place, they end up with more stuff than, and not less stuff. Like every time they keep going in, unless they do something stupid and, and make God angry or upset, that's, that's kind of what happens, is that God is with them and God makes it possible for them to take this land that they didn't do anything to earn because he loves them. But they see this place as like the, just the divine place of God because of all of those things. Because God has gotten them to that place. This is where God is. God is all over this place. God is in this place. And so they build this temple for God. And they, they have a permanent home for God in this place. And so for them to be pulled out of, out of Israel and into Babylon is to be separated from God. And then to be told, you're going to die separated from God. That is not good news for any of them. To the Israelites, they... They've been, they've been taken out of the promised land because, because they, after all that God had done for them, they forgot. Deuteronomy says, like, when you look back and you see all the divine providence of God on your life, don't forget. And they forgot. So they're being drugged out of the promised land and into a foreign place where they're going to be exiled. Where they're going to die there. And it is in that. It is in that moment. That verse 11 comes. The one that we like to hang up all over our house. And you know. Make a, make a really big fuss about. And verse 11 says. For I know the plans I have for you. Declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. And not to harm you. Plans for hope. And a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and the places that I have banished you, declares the Lord. I'll bring you back to this place because I've carried you into exile. Now, to me, and I think it's okay to ask questions like this, but one of the things that I started to ask when I started reading this and studying for this was it doesn't it seem a little bit insensitive for God to say, I know the plans that I have for you and they're plans to prosper you and they're plans for hope and a future. Doesn't that seem insensitive to a 49-year-old man who is now in exile and is going to die in exile? Where is the hope and where is the future in that? Where do you find hope in that moment? Have you ever asked that question? Like, God, where's the hope? I don't see it. You said you're going to give me. I don't. How am I supposed to have hope right now? Right? Like, where, where do you find hope when inflation continues to rise and yet your paycheck stays the same and it's pennies on the dollar and you can barely skate by? Where's the hope when your wife gets diagnosed with cancer and is given a very short period of time to live and there's only a 15% chance of survival? Where's the hope when a little girl gets killed in a car accident? 
Where's the hope when, when, when you have, have worked for a really, really long time? You're 65 years down until your fingers are down to the bone and you work so hard just to save enough so that you could retire and then the stock market crashes and then it's all gone. Where's the hope? Where's the hope? These are things that have all happened in our lifetimes. These are things that have all happened in our generation. These are things that happen every day in someone's life. Where's the hope? Well, I, I want us to understand something that I think that God wants us to understand as well. Is that like our hope is not wrapped up in our circumstance. Our hope is wrapped up in the fact that we know he is still at work even when our circumstances look really, really bleak. And his work is not maybe necessarily to rise you up to thinner stage so you can be the, 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 like the, the master of your own story. It might just be that you play an extra role in his. And you have to be okay with that. And you have to still maintain hope, knowing that, man, God's still got a plan. That God's still doing something. You know, um, there was something that, that came to mind, and I want, to, I want us to kind of grab it, like, is that while I was, while I was studying this, and it's that you have the time you have. You know what I mean by that? Like, the Bible says you're not going to be able to add a single hour to your life by worrying or thinking, like, you, the, the time you have is the time you have. The time that the Israelites had, they had 70 years. For some of them, that meant they had 25 left. For some of them, that meant that they had 70 because they were just born. You have the time that you have. The, 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 the question is not, like, how much time do I have and what are my circumstances? No, the, 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 the thought is, is that I have the time I have. I'm going to do whatever God has called me to do with the time I got left. Because that's the only hope and future for the Israelites. The only hope and the only future for most of the Israelites is to do what God said, which was settle down, start having babies, start building a family, start praying for the prosperity of Babylon, start living in this place. If you live in this place, your people will have a hope and I'll have some people to bring back to the promised land in 70 years. But if you give up and you don't trust in my plan, But I think I think this is I think this is really important that we understand that like we only have a certain amount of time and what we do at that time is we do whatever God has called us to do at that time. And if that's to settle down and get comfortable and be an extra in his story that he's writing, then that's what we do. Because his ways are not our ways and his plans are not our plans and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we have to be okay with that. We're gonna, it's going to be really, really hard to follow Jesus. It'll be really easy to go to church. It'll be really easy to sing some songs. It'll be really easy to put Bible verses in our houses and say, I know the plans. The plans to prosper. Maybe. Maybe they are. But for these exiles, these exiles, their only hope was in doing whatever God had called them to do. Doing what God had called them to do with the time that they had left. So that then he could bring his people back. And we have to understand that even when we don't realize what's going on, God's got a plan. So we can still have hope. Even when we don't like the role we're playing in his plan. We can still have hope. I want to. I want to try and help us understand how God uses his plan. Not for always our good. And not for always our glory, but for his good and for his glory. Help us understand how God is at the center of this story. I want to tell you a story about a guy named Steve Saint. Steve Saint uh, was a missionary. 
and he had a heart to go to Timbuktu, Africa, and be a missionary in Timbuktu. And so he, you know, does this whole missionary training and all that kind of stuff, flies over to Timbuktu, Africa, lands in Timbuktu, gets off the plane. Everybody that's waiting on his plane to land loads up, and his plane takes, plane takes off. He has no turning back. Right. He's like he is in Timbuktu. He has no turning back. He's got to figure out how do I survive? How do I live? And how do I begin to make impact for the gospel in this place? And so he starts scouring the city. He's scared. He's afraid. He's he's an exile. He's a foreigner. He doesn't know what to do, uh, but he's just trying to find somebody in the streets who can speak English or a little bit of French. I like just speak a little bit of English or a little bit of French because because that, that's the two things that he knew. And so he was trying to find somebody, and it took him a really, really long time of scouring the streets, but he finally found someone, and, and he told him, hey, like, I'm just looking to get some help. I'm trying to figure out a place where I could stay, a place where I can get a warm meal and maybe a, a bed to sleep in, whatever. Like, he's just in that space, and they, this, this person that he finds takes him to this house, and on the outside of this house is a picture of Jesus hanging on a cross, nail-pierced hands and, and, and feet, and, and he's like, oh, man, here's a Christian. The, the, the person that lives here is a follower of Jesus. And so they knock on the door, and this, this native guy from Timbuktu comes out, and his name is Nu. And, um, and Nu doesn't speak any English, so they got to find a translator so that they can communicate. But eventually they get into a place where, where they can communicate with one another. They start to talk to one another. And, and Steve just looks at Nu and says, hey, like, tell me a little bit about your story. Like, tell me how you became a Christian. Tell me how you began to serve here in Timbuktu and all of these other kinds of things. And, and Nu told him, that when he was a small boy, he lived in a very poor village, and he was a very poor young man. And he, he went to this place where he knew that there was food, and it was a missionary house. And he tried to steal food because he was just that hungry. He just wanted to eat. And so he went into this house, and he began to, he began to try and steal some food, and he got caught. But instead of like being and getting in trouble, the missionaries loved him, gave him the food that he wanted, gave him gifts, shared the gospel with him, and New became a follower of Jesus. Now, New began to just love Jesus so much that he wanted to share that with his family. And so he began to share the gospel with his family. And when he shared the gospel with his family, his mom tried to poison him and kill him. When that didn't work, she kicked him out of the house. And New lived on the streets. He lived homeless for most of his adolescent life, just trying to find enough food to eat uh, to be able to survive, but always maintaining hope, always maintaining this passion for the gospel. And he began to just, you know, soak it all in. He was just completely estranged and ostracized from his entire community. And Steve looked at New and said, like, how did, how did that how did how were you able to do that? Like, how were you able to like push through those circumstances, maintain hope, maintain like like that that, that God was going to take care of you, maintain like? And he said, "Well, when I was a boy, those missionaries that led me to Jesus, they gave me a book. It was a book of martyrs, stories of people who had lost their life, serving other people and sharing the gospel." He said, there was one story that I constantly came back to, no matter how bad it got, I could always go to that story and find hope and find solace and find, uh, f- find, uh, find peace and find rest and find, um, and, and find encouragement. And it was a story of five men who went to Ecuador in the 1950s, who on the banks of a river were killed. Those five men were Jim Elliott, Ed McCauley, Roger Yowderin, Peter Flim- Pete Fleming, and the pilot, Nate Saint. And I just kept saying, if they could die for their faith, so could I. If they could give their life for the gospel, so could I. And Steve tried to push back tears. He said, you know, New, I know this story really well. My father was Nate Saint. I was four years old when he was killed. And all the way in Timbuktu, the story of God's plan and the things that God is doing was unfolding in the pages of these two men's life as they sat there and had a conversation about how to 
have hope under dire circumstances. And in that moment, they knew what God was doing to bring Him glory through it all. The seven individuals impacted by the same event, seven stories, seven plans, seven ideas of what hope and a future look like. And yet in that moment, sitting there together, none of them could have imagined what God was going to do in that moment and in that, in that place. The story that God was going to unveil and that he was writing. God does have a plan. And it may be that you prosper and it may be that you don't. It may mean that you lose your life. It may mean that you lose your father. It may mean that you get kicked out of your own house and poisoned by your own family. But God can use that to bring Him glory and to do more than we could ever dream or imagine. So when you start to ask yourself, where is the hope? Remember that even if you can't see it, God's doing something. Even when life feels like a mess, God's making sense of the mess. And it may mean that your life makes a drastic turn for the better. And it may mean that you stay in your circumstance until you die. But maybe, just maybe, God will use that story of faithful obedience in the midst of dire circumstances to give others hope in a future generation. You aren't the subject of the story. We're just characters that should be grateful. God gives us a part to play. And we should take that part and we should do what he has called us to do with it. Good or bad. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for your mercy and kindness and goodness. God, also thank you for just giving us an understanding of what it looks like to be faithful, of what it looks like to follow you and your plans. And God, may we have hope this morning. May we have hope this morning that even if it isn't what we would choose or even if it isn't the news that we would want to hear or even if it isn't um, our ideal situation, God, that you are working in that for your good and for your glory. And so, God, may we be faithful. May we be obedient. May we do what you've called us to do. That even if it doesn't change our life, it might change the life of someone in the future. God, come and meet us in that place. Let us wrestle with your word. Let us wrestle with what we feel in our hearts when it comes to the truth of that. with grace and mercy and kindness meet us in that place show us show us the hope of just trusting your plan God we love you we praise you and thank you in Jesus name Amen just uh
I want to lead us into a time where we focus on the table and the Lord's Supper. There are four tables throughout our room here. We have two up front, two in the back. And in just a minute, I'm going to invite you to stand and walk to one of these tables and take some bread and take a cup. And remember that the body of Christ was broken and the blood of Christ was shed in order that we could have life, in order that we could have hope, in order that we could have um, a future hope of being reunited with the God who loves us and saves us. And so, um, but, but if, if we're honest, we, we probably wouldn't have written a story that way. And I don't know why God chose to write it that way. It's the mystery of the gospel. It's the mystery of the good news. That he would come out of heaven and step into our depravity, into our sin, into our shame, and be willing to die on a cross, allowing his body to be broken, his blood to be shed for us. It's a mystery as to why he wrote it that way. Why he did it that way. And when we stand at the, at the crossroads of this mystery, may, may, we just, may we just find hope. Knowing that we were once dead in our sins and trespasses, but now we're alive in Christ Jesus our Lord because of it. That we were once without a hope, foreigners and aliens separated from God, but now He has brought all people back and brought all people into the family of God. That we could have hope and a future. That we could be family. We could be united. You know, I think, for me, I think about my sin. I think about the fact that Jesus was on the cross, and when he died, he had the full weight of my sin. Now, I know how, how bad that is. My guess is you do, too. And he had that full weight on himself. And he went to the tomb with the weight of our sin and our guilt on his shoulders. And then three days later, he walked out and left sin in, a, in the grave. So that you and I don't have to feel the weight of that. But we get to experience the glory of God which is Christ and salvation. So as we get up and as we worship and as we take communion this morning, may we remember this is where hope comes from. This is why we, no matter what, are willing to be obedient to the call that God has put on our life. Because when His name was called, He was obedient to death, even death on cross for you for me and may we live in response to that hope that we have god thank you for the hope that we have in christ for the life that we have the future that is able to be to be lived out and taken hold of may we be people of hope this morning as we remember your love May we never forget what you brought us out of. The chains in which you've released us from. We love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys would stand and begin to respond by taking communion worshiping with us, we'd really appreciate that.